Thank you, worship team. Uh, we're grateful. I am, actually, for I'm sure everybody is here for all the time you've spent preparing and, and, uh, uh, and, and serving in that capacity. Thank you very much. You're faithful, faithful people. And uh, the AV team, I'm so grateful for your help <laughs> in, uh, uh, all the time, but especially uh, uh, this week uh, and last week, too, actually. Uh, we had, I had some slides that went away uh, this week, and we tried to get them corralled, so hopefully we got it all worked out. So we can uh, so we can share. Um, uh, again, th those of you who are here, welcome. Uh, maybe visiting with us and for the first time, welcome to New Hanover Church. We're we're thankful that you have chosen uh, us to again to worship with, and trust that the Lord will speak to you uh, today, uh, as He has been to me over these last uh, oh. Ooh, several weeks that I've been struggling with this particular lesson, certainly in earnest this week after I finished up last week. But uh, so, uh, let me uh, let me pray for us, if you would, please. So, Father, we uh, as we come before you this, uh, today, Lord, um, our hearts uh, prepared and and open to uh, your Spirit, Lord, and what you have for us to learn today. Uh, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work, uh, would, would speak through me to those who are gathered, and that um, uh, our time together uh, now would be something that would be honoring and glorifying to you. So uh, thank you for that, I thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. So uh, for those of you who were uh, here last week, you remember we uh, were spent most of our time in Second Timothy talking about that, and we're going to... I visited that a little bit today, uh, just uh, and kind of uh, piggyback on that for our message. Um, the, and so uh, last week we spent uh, the first, uh, uh, spent our time in the first five verses of this uh, letter from Paul, the Apostle Paul. It's the second letter he wrote to Timothy, um, and Timothy was serving in the capacity of a pastor in Ephesus. And um, so this is his uh, uh Paul's letter to his young protege and his friend, uh, and it's really an exhortation. Uh, he's exhorting him, admonishing him uh, for uh, uh, for things that are yet to come, and and uh, for uh, for uh, how he should uh, prepare himself. So, um, but uh, we saw in in chapters uh, one through five, we. Uh, excuse me, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 1, we learned a little bit about Timothy and, and about his background and the fact that he, from childhood, was taught the scriptures. His mother, Lois, uh, and his grandmother, Eunice, were faithful in teaching him per the, the, the scriptures. And they had come to, uh, they, they were Jewish, Jewesses, as it were, uh, and they had come to faith in Christ. Uh, they read the faith for script, scriptures faithfully. They understood the uh, Messiah. They understood the significance of that. When they saw Jesus and they heard him speak, they knew that he was indeed the Messiah. And so they had embraced uh, Christianity and embraced uh, uh, the gospel. Uh, and they taught that to Timothy. They were faithful to do that and to pray for him and demonstrate through their lives uh, how uh, that, that, that were lived in a, uh, unhypocritical way. That's what, remember, we talked about that last week. And um, so, uh, and they prayed for, for Timothy, and then, of course, so Paul comes along, uh, and uh, he, would, uh, when he went through there with Barnabas, and, the, and had a chance to meet Timothy, and be a part of uh, mentoring him, and discipling him as well. And that's, and he, he, he took Timothy with him on his missionary journey, uh, that he had, uh, 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 on his second missionary journey, and uh, then he, uh, on the way back, they had stopped back in Ephesus, and uh, they, he left Timothy there, uh, and uh, then went back, uh, ended up going back to Rome. So, or actually went on another missionary journey. So, um, the balance of Second Timothy, as you recall, as I mentioned, is an exhortation uh, that builds uh, strongly on the, on, on the verses one through five, and Timothy's faith and how he was taught and how he was brought up and what, was, what, was put, what he had in him uh, but because of his relationship to Christ through the Holy Spirit. 
Now, uh, last week, if you recall, we took a kind of 20,000 foot tour of uh, 2 Timothy. And we're going to review that just briefly here and then get into the body of, of the message here. But if you recall, uh, there are four total chapters uh, in, uh, in this short book, this short epistle or letter, as it were. And uh, in chapter 1, from starting in verse 6, after uh, the verses that we pick up where we left off last year, last week, excuse me, and uh, uh, Paul admonishes uh, Timothy to be bold. Uh, he's, uh, Timothy had a tendency to be timid, to not, you know, uh, stand up and not be bold and be, take initiative. And so be bold. And in doing so, guard the truth. Uh, protect the truth and the, the sanctity of what you've learned and what what uh, from the uh, from me and from and what you've learned uh, about Jesus from those who who have poured their lives into you. In chapter two, uh, he says to be strong. He says uh, uh, endure suffering. Suffering's going to come along, so just be prepared. And endure the, the difficulties that you're encountering right now with the leadership at, at your church, but also be prepared for the future. Be strong, just remain strong. Um, and uh, and, to, and to, to be prepared and endure the suffering. And then um, piggybacking on that in chapter 3, he, again, he's talking with him about remaining faithful and being prepared and understanding and knowing what God's will is so that he is indeed... Uh, able to uh, to uh, f fight off the enemy and to speak boldly and proclaim the, the uh, message of the gospel. And then the chapter 4, he pretty much closes out by just saying, hey man, preach the word. Preach the word. Be faithful to preach the word. Preach the gospel. And that is what the word is, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what he focuses on. Now, um, so, uh, again, Paul is, understands, too, of something that maybe Timothy doesn't, is that at this point in time, the Romans were persecuting Christians. Uh, the, uh, uh, some of you from your history lessons may recall that Rome burned, right? And there was this big fire and that Nero actually set, but uh, he happened to be the guy in charge then. He blamed the Christians. And so all the, uh, Paul had been arrested a second time, and was now in a prison, a dungeon, as it were, in Rome when he writes this letter. The dungeons is this 30-foot hole that he was in, and it just had uh, 30 foot wide, and it has this one little hole that, that uh, you were able to access through it, and it was not a fun place to be. But that's where God had him, and, and so Paul he was joyful, and he was trying to be joyful in his writings to to Timothy and be encouraging to him. But he knew that once he was executed and he could know, he knew that that was just inevitable, uh, that it, you know, all heck would break, break loose on the Christians and they would, the persecution would accelerate. And so he wants, uh, he's trying to prepare Timothy for this. So be faithful, preach the word. Now, um, we, we, I mentioned last week and, and about the hardships and persecution and that, that uh, Timothy was encountering and that Paul had encountered. And um, uh, in his, uh, Paul wrote a, a, an epistle to the Philipp Philippians, okay, to the church at Philippi, which we know as Philippians. And uh, in chapter 2 uh, of that verse, beginning at 15 and following, uh, Paul summarizes, I think, very well uh, what the, the hardships that uh, talks about hardships and what lies ahead for that. Uh, and so uh, let me read that with you. It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Okay? Uh, so he's talking about joyous, joyously proclaiming the gospel and to do so in a manner that proves that you are holy and blameless uh, in the eyes of Christ because uh, uh, he goes on children of God, okay? Above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, okay? Crooked and perverse generation. I think 
those of you sitting here, for the most part, would say, hey, that's, that looks like what we're living in today. Did I get an amen to that? <laughs> but seriously, it does. And so uh, this crooked and perverse generation. And so the sermon, uh, the title is, uh, the sermon that I named it, uh, that, that, not that anybody cares, but it's living in a crooked and perverse generation. And uh, so let me go on here in, in, chapter, in verse 15 of chapter 2 of Philippians. It says, uh, living uh, uh, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. So that's what he's telling Timothy over here uh, in 2 Timothy. Be the light of the world, okay? Uh, so that in the day of Christ, uh, excuse me, holding forth the word of life, so being faithful to the word, holding on to it, being faithful to preach it, uh, so that in the day of Christ, uh, the, in other words, whenever he, Paul talking about himself here, goes to be with the Lord, that I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. And he's saying this applies to you too, Timothy, because uh, you, know, you don't want to, uh, in your life, wondering if you, how you did. You want to end your life just like Paul did when he describes uh, at the end of 2 Timothy in chapter 4, he describes, I have run the race. I've finished the course. And he goes on to talk about the fact that he had finished well. And so he's wanting Timothy to do the same thing. Now, uh, for some time, uh, now I have been personally uh, very troubled about our society and how it's uh, become increasingly hostile, uh, hostile toward people of faith uh, or anyone that might disagree with the other's point of view. And how along the way, civility has kind of become a thing of the past, uh, in, even in our dialogues and discussions that, that we have with people. And um, we get to hide behind uh, Facebook, you know, or, or, or uh, some technology media that we might use uh, and say all these ugly, terrible things. And not only that, but we have, uh, uh, perf uh, the, uh, we have per uh, a lot of uh, political and per pervasive activity going on in our country. Uh, you know, people's morals have declined. We have all that stuff going on around us. You know what it is. I don't have to go into details with it. It is a perverse generation. And um, this has really been troubling for me. And uh, in reality, you know, these are not new battles or challenges for people of faith, as we've seen, as we just read about uh, but it's been one that has been experienced by God's people since the fall. And uh, every, no matter where you read in Scripture, you, you know, you, particularly in the Old Testament, you see you know, God uh, takes the people out of, uh, out of uh, Egypt, and what do they immediately do? They build an idol. Uh, hello? You know, hello? So, um, so uh, and while it's true that Scripture reveals to us the, the evil and corrupt generations of the past, it also displays how the hand of God has perpetuated a remnant throughout history who, or has raised someone up who, throughout history and has, um, has done so more often than not by using ordinary people, ordinary people as catalysts and, or instruments of deliverance. And uh, again, we see that played out in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in, in, our, in, in, our, in history since then, in different times in history, we see that played out in, in, as well. Ordin God's using ordinary people for deliverance or for change. Uh, and, um, and so... Uh, you know, of course, the exception uh, to that was Jesus. He wasn't an ordinary person. But when he came along, the playing field changed a little bit because now it's not God's chosen people, but it's the world. It's God's chosen people and all the Gentiles which fall in this world category. 
So now the playing field's changed. And, uh, but he still, the methodology, it isn't. They used ordinary people. What was ordinary, ordinary about the disciples? They were fishermen, right? They were tradesmen, tax collectors. Look at, you know, I mean, just on and on. with are ordinary people. And use these people to ultimately accomplish uh, the change that, that he wanted to happen and that uh, uh, their faithfulness uh, delivered. Now, and while reportedly every generation claims that the, the persecution and, and the debauchery that of its time is the most severe uh, and without equal, I, 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 the um, many of us gathered here today, myself included, <laughs> uh, would take issue with that. So um, recently uh, I read a book uh, by Eric Metaxas uh, entitled Letter to the American Church, which in some ways affirmed my own personal uh, perspective on the cultural uh, decline in the United States uh, and the threat to us as a republic, uh, as we know it. And, and in this book, uh, it was published a year, uh, last year, it's just, it's just a year old, 2022, Metaxas begins by stating the reason he's writing the book. And uh, I, uh, let me read from that. It says, I am convinced that the American church is in an, at an impossible, excuse me, uh, impossibly, almost unbearably important inflection point. The parallels to which where the German church was in the 1930s is unavoidable and grim. So the only question and what concerns us in this slim volume, it's a, it is a small volume, it's about, you know, about that thick, uh, and uh, is whether we might understand those parallels and thereby avoid the fatal mistakes that the German church made during that time and their superlatively catastrophic results. He goes on. If we do not, I am convinced that we will reap a whirlwind greater even than one they did. Now, just uh, for, some, for those of you who may not be one or maybe sitting and wondering what Metaxas is talking about here and what might have, uh, it have to do with you, with you personally uh, and with the church, Big C, uh, you know, uh, and as, as he addresses the American church, American church isn't the only part of the Big C, but, uh, and in us here at New Hanover Church. So uh, j just hang with me. Uh, we'll get there. I think that by the time we get to the end of the message, you'll understand a little bit more. Now, in the introduction to the book, Metaxas makes this statement at the introduction. He says, it is for good or ill that America plays an inescapable central role in the world. The extent to which that central role has been used for good and for God's purposes has had everything to do with our churches or with the American church, as he calls her. He goes uh, on and he says, if America is in any way exceptional, it has nothing to do with the blood that runs through American veins and everything to do with the bloodshed for us at Calvary. And the extent to which we have acknowledged this and, and the part that the church in America has played in encouraging, creating, and sustaining a culture of liberty which we have done. You think about, it. you know, this, the United States, okay, I went back and counted them, okay? And just in, in the period of time between World War II and today, we've been involved in more than 40, more than 40 wars or skirmishes where we came to the raid, rescue of a country that was, that was battling for freedom and democracy from terrorism and from dictatorship. Anybody remember Grenada? Okay? And then it was uh, in Lebanon. It was other, uh, other places that we've done that. And we've come in as a, quote, police force, as it were. And then you count them up. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it just blows you away. I couldn't, I, I was just blown away how many there were. I, I just quit counting. So, um, so he's referring to, to, those, to the fact that America has, has been the, the image bearer. And the church has been a part of that. The church, which, which our foundations of the country rest on scripture. Now, I'll come back to that point. 
in a little bit later, okay? So now let's go back for a moment to the reference of the, the German church in the 30s. And while uh, we don't have, uh, we really don't have sufficient time for, to, to go into detail, I, I'm a, I, I could, I can't tell you how many you know, pages and stuff I've read here, but um, let me summarize here. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, Marxist influences began to infiltrate uh, the go German government, uh, promoted in large part, part by Adolf Hitler, right? He was young, he, was, he, he, he got wrapped up in socialism and Marxist, Marxist doctrine, and he began to uh, kind of play a low-key role and, and, and gain prominence over a period of time. And as Hitler and, Ma and, and the, his Marxist philosophy gained momentum, the Lutheran Church, which effectively was the predominant re religion uh, in Germany at the time, uh, refused to stand up for the gospel against the godless philosophies and doctrines that are perpetuated uh, by uh, Marxism and, in fact, the German government. And if you're, for, if you're familiar with the history, the, the, the Lutheran Church effectively became the, ch the, the, uh, the Church of Germany because it was the Fuhrer that was calling the shots. They, they came and partnered with and effectively lowered, uh, began to allow the government to tell them more and more what to do and exercise more and more control over what they could say, what they couldn't say, and what have you. And the gospel message essentially just went out the door. And um, so uh, some of you might recognize the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, now Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor who, who opposed the state church, as it were, as it had become, uh, and was executed for his stand uh, a few short weeks before the defeat of Germany. Now, um, and I don't know about you, but, but through my eyes, okay, I see a tremendous parallel between what's happening in the United States and what went on in Germany, not only in the government and our society, but as the American population has been indoctrinated and embraced, granted some unknowingly, a Marxist socialist philosophy in our own country. And it's, again, promoted by many in power within the uh, American church, uh, uh, excuse me, many in power uh, politically, but the American church as a whole has not only remained silent, but in many denominations has believed the lie and ignored the precious doctrines of the faith. They no longer hold to inerrancy of the scriptures. They ordain gays and lesbians. They married gay and lesbian people. The precious doctrines uh, that we hold dear have been swept out the door. As a young boy, uh, I was exposed. I was born in 1943. Okay, as early part, early on in the war. That's before we got involved in, in the European conflict, part of the war. But um, and anyway, um, I was exposed to the horrors uh, of World War II uh, via graphic print media. Now, now how, how could a three, four, five-year-old kid get exposed to that kind of stuff? Well, uh, for those of us uh, of, of, of my generation, uh, we remember that Time Magazine used to publish these hardback volumes of information th about things that had happened in the world. And I remember distinctly having this, quote, coffee table book, if, as we would call it today, and looking at it and going through it, uh, with, and this was post-World War II, okay? But I remember the horrors because I saw the pictures of bodies stacked up and skeletons like hundreds and hundreds, you couldn't count them in these big holes. And the people being rescued from Auschwitz they looked just like, you know, just had the glassy eyes and they looked like they were dead, emaciated. I remember those things. I've never forgotten them. And uh, the Holocaust Museum, I don't know if, if any of you have ever read, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I don't know if any of you have ever visited, but 
It is chilling and very sobering. And we went to it uh, in two or three administrations back. I won't say which one. Uh, but uh, it, it was, um, uh, we, um, we went to it then, and, and I could see the, pa- they, 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 they traced the rise of, of, of Adolf Hitler in power. And they paid, and the, the, this narrative I'm telling you is, is uh, it may not be Christian in nature, but the story is there on the walls of that museum. And you cannot help but see the parallels you just read excerpts from the newspapers, from the publications and what have you that were of the time that were promoting the same types of things that we're seeing here. Now, I'm not here with a political message, okay? So, so, but but it, is part, it is critical to what I've got to tell you. So you need to understand the background here. So um, anyway, I'll never forget going in there either. Uh, it, it, I won't say it changed me, but it really, it just reinforced you know, m- memories and things that I already knew that I kind of pushed to the side like the rest of us tend, tend to do. We don't, war is ugly. Yeah, in, in its best scenario, it's ugly. Now, um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn is another name that some of you may or may not know. But he was a, a Russian writer, a prominent uh, Soviet dissident, as it were, and uh, he, was a, he was also an outspoken critic of communism. And, and he helped raise global awareness uh, of the political repression that was going on in the Soviet Union with books that he wrote that he smuggled out of the countries so he could get them published in the United States or in Europe or what have you. And um, he um, was sentenced to the gulag. He was serving in the Red Army. He was a captain. And he sent a personal letter to a friend in which he criticized Joseph Stalin. And they arrested him for that and put him in prison in the Gulag for eight years. And then they took his citizenship away from him, and he he was under internal exile for a number of years after that. And um, he he finally uh, immigrated to the United States in 1976, where he moved his family here. And he continued to write after he came. And uh, uh, he uh, later returned to Germany, uh, and, uh, and then uh, he died in, in 2008. But he's well-known, uh, and for those of you who may not be aware, he's well-known especially for a speech he gave at Harvard University. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I could say some tongue-in-cheek remark about that, but I won't. Uh, so uh, he, he won a Nobel Prize uh, for his uh, works. Uh, and in um, 18, 1983, he received the, what was called the Templeton Prize for uh, Progress in Religion. And uh, in his speech that he gave uh, upon acceptance of that, and I won't share the whole thing with you, but, but um, the title of the speech was Men Have Forgotten God. That was the name of the speech. And The speech begins like this. Uh, Again, I'm not going to give you the whole speech, but there's some critical points here that I think are helpful. Um, More than half a century ago, while I was still a child, this is Solzhenitsyn writing, uh, I recall hearing a number of older people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. Many have forgotten God. That's why all this happened. That was the... Uh, that, was, that was their explanation. Since then, I've spent well now 50 years working on the history of our revolution. He talked about the German revolution that followed World War I. Uh, and in the process, I have read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own toward the effort of clearing away the rubble left behind that upheaval. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible, the main cause of the ruinous revelation that swallowed up some 60 million of our people. 60 million people killed in the Russian Revolution. I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this happened. He goes on, what is more, 
the events of the Russian Revolution can only be understood now at the end of the century against the background of what since has occurred in the rest of the world. And what emerges here is a process of universal significance. And if I were called upon to identify briefly the principal trait of the entire 20th century, here too I would be unable to find anything more precise and pithy than to repeat it once again. Men have forgotten God. Now the rest of the speech goes on and fills in some more details about uh, about experiences and what have you. But this was, I mean, these these are the critical points from it. Uh, from the, and, and that because he put them in his introduction. And uh, excuse me, uh, I, I sat down to read this Harvard speech this week, and uh, I mean, it's a, if you think I was long-winded, you ought to read that speech. I mean. <laughs> it, he was probably there a day given that thing. Uh, but this, wow, it was, it was uh, impactful. Um, uh, I re read this week, I actually came across my, uh, my, my feed that I get from uh, Christian B Business New uh, Network uh, and um, the Christian Bible Network, I'm sorry, um, that uh, a study that was done post-COVID, COVID, excuse me, 19, um, by George Barnard. Uh, and he reported that uh, in that study, one of the conclusions of the study, uh, that the percentage of adults with a biblical worldview has plummeted to just four, grant one, two, three, four percent. The percentage of adults that hold a biblical worldview has plummeted four percent in the United States. Now, uh, Lee's back there on his phone. He's making the calculations to see what that translates into. But, but in any event, it's a, that's a pretty alarming number. I mean, you think about it. Okay, we, we understand that from data that we know from other studies that, uh, the, um, that the number of, of people who profess, uh, who show an interest in God has declined significantly. But the people who uh, profess, quote, uh, some... Uh, spiritual uh, relationship, uh, say if, say it, I mean, it's 50-50, 50%, just say it's 50% of that. And when you, when you take that number and you drill it down, there's only about, there's about 10% that are, are evangelicals that, in theory, would hold a biblical worldview. And here we are, the study, hot off the press, Four percent. And again, that is pretty frightening. Now, the study does go on to talk about the sharp decline and, and, and look at, at um, why they think it's the way it is. And based upon other information they gather at the time, it appears that, that this decline, the significant decline, uh, comes from the initial fallout of the lockdowns and the government edicts and the churches not meeting uh, during the pandemic. All of these things that, that were exercised that, uh, that keep us from coming together, uh, and I'm not saying that, there's, that I'm a conspiracy theorist and that they, that was part of what they wanted to do, but, but still the, the, the fact remains that that's what happened, that's history, and it has had a significant impact. We all know that uh, you know, uh, mental illness is up. The statistics are much higher on that, right, at Garland? Since post-COVID, it's gone up dramatically. Suicides have gone up dramatically. Uh, it seemed like to me, I read, uh, Gail, correct me if I'm wrong, with it, every 36 seconds, uh, somebody kills himself. Hmm? Every, I'm sorry? Seconds. Okay. <laughs> Talk about startling. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so, uh, so, uh, even more trouble is, one is, uh, is if one looks at the study results, okay, and, and then begins to explore what parents and churches are doing strategically. And this is from the study itself. I actually, if anybody wants to see it, I've got a copy of it with me. Uh, yeah, I don't want to read from it uh, today, but uh, for, in the interest of time. But um, they explore from a strategic perspective, okay, what, is, what are parents... And what is the church doing about this? Nothing. 
nothing, that's what the study concluded, that uh, the, uh, the churches are doing strategically to, uh, what are, they explored what parents and churches are doing to strategically to alter that trend, and the fact is both are doing next to nothing to change their or their children's world view. Okay. Now, um, so let, let me just kind of to move on here. Let's talk about, when I talk about a biblical worldview, what am I talking about? Okay. All right. Um, some of you may be familiar with a work that, that uh, Francis Schaeffer did that wrote in 1976 that, that was entitled, How Then Should We Live? That was the name of the book, and the subtitle of the book was The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture. Now, the book was written in 1976, and so when I'm reading it this week, uh, it scared the bejeebers out of me because he's, it is prophetic. I see you shaking your head, Charles. So you've read it, right? It is alarmingly prophetic. But it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant piece, a uh, brilliant treatise in my opinion anyway. And, and, uh, but Schaefer analyzed uh, the reasons for modern society's state of affairs and presented the only, and, and said his conclusion was that the only viable alternative was living by a Christian ethic, that is, holding a Christian worldview, uh, living by the Christian ethic, acceptance of God's revelation, and total affirmation of the Bible's morals, values, and meaning. In other words, as I mentioned, holding a biblical worldview. That's the only viable solution to preventing the destruction of society and, and our nation as we know it. And uh, Chuck Colson... Uh, along with uh, his colleague Nancy Piercy, uh, they published a similar work uh, titled, um, in 1999, titled How Then, How Now, excuse me, How Now Should We Live? And the foundational premise of this book is that Christianity is more than a, a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it, it's also uh, a worldview that not only answers life's basic questions of what, where, excuse me, that, that answers life's basic question: where did we come from and who are we? And then what went wrong and then gives a solution what we can, to what can we do to fix it. And uh, the biblical worldview uh, show, shows us how to do that. And uh, they concluded in their work uh, that one's worldview effectively determines how they function in every area of their lives. Um, essentially, how they live their lives and how they make decisions. And they conclude uh, this, with this statement, okay? In the case of government, the prevailing world view determines how they will govern. What is the prevailing word, world view in our world today? You think about it. It's not biblical, is it? Those that hold to a biblical worldview are uh, afforded the understanding, the confidence, and tools to confront the world's bankrupt views. They, they talk about this in the book. Uh, and to restore and redeem every aspect of contemporary uh, family education, ethics, work, book, and law. So, in other words, if people who have a Christian worldview have the opportunity and through, to the, through, the, uh, through their lives and the, people of, the lives of the people they encounter, and their children that they disciple uh, to essentially uh, restore and redeem uh, all of the contemporary family education, ethics, work law, politics, science, etc., across the board. We, as the church, big C, little c, here at the Hanover Church, okay, have, uh, if we hold to a Christian worldview as we purport, that many of us report, purport that we do, and as a church we do, okay, then we have the tools in our hand. We have the tools in our hand to restore and redeem society and our country and our families. And to, and you just keep on doing, going and down the list. Now, um, so we, we come full circles. Uh, actually, Colson closes his, his, remark, his book by this, and I, 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 I think it's very important. 
And so we come full circle back to the questions which we began the book with. Can Christians really make a difference in the world? Okay, that, uh, does the Christian worldview give us the map we need for living? Can a culture be rebuilt so all the world can see in its splendor and glory the contours of God's kingdom? Can we really make the world a new creation? Those individuals we have met on the pages show uh, the, of the book that he's talking about show us that the answer is emphatically yes. And, and, and the book is full uh, uh, of some really dramatic, life-changing experiences that people went through. And, and uh, when they met Christ and changed their, per, their worldview from one that was really focused on themselves and self-gratification and, 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 uh, and to one that uh, was a biblical worldview. Every day you and I are making decisions, he goes on here, every day you and I are making decisions that help construct one kind of world or another. Are we co-opted by the faddish worldviews of our age or are we helping create a new world of peace, love, and forgiveness? He, he, he continues, how now shall we live? And he answers his own question here by saying, by embracing God's truth, understanding the physical and moral order he has created, lovingly contending for that truth with our neighbors, and then having the courage to live it out in every walk of our life. And he closes here with this last statement, boldly, sound like Paul, and yes, joyously, sound like Paul in Philippians 2. Now, as I, as I read the final paragraphs and pondered these questions uh, and these statements in it, um, and I especially was caught up by this final statement here that, that, um, um, that Colson makes uh, uh, when, he, when he says, by embracing God's truth, understanding the physical and moral order he's created, lovingly contending for that truth with our neighbors, then having the courage to leave it out in every day, walk of our life, boldly and yes, joyously. I could not help but think, I mean, well, I'll say, I thought of it. Evidently, I didn't because this cross thought my mind. I mean, this, this thought crossed my mind very quickly. And it said, is it truly that simple? I, I, I said, is it, I read it, the, I had to read it several times. I said, is it truly that simple? So after you know, meditating on this a bit, praying about it, uh, I realized that one could not overlook that the summer as a whole, especially that the questions that served as the foundational reasons for the book. Remember with the, those foundational questions, where did we come from, who are we, what's going wrong, and what can we do to fix it? That's the whole premise of that book. And it was then I realized and so that God, through his word, has indeed provided all that we need to lovingly contend for the truth. And our charge is to have courage and boldness to live it out. So what? So what do we do? How do we do that? How can I contend for the truth, both spiritually and practically. Now, look this word up, contend, and uh, uh, Webster defines it as to strive or buy in a contest, uh, battle, rivalry, or against difficulties. So, uh, going back to Second Timothy for a moment, Paul has given us a road map to be bold. Boldness is what was, uh, was mentioned by Colson in, in his closing remarks here. Guard the truth, the truth, the truth being the gospel message, the biblical message. And be strong, we have to be brave, we have to not be timid, but we have to be brave and be willing to stand up and endure the pain for today that we had suffered through the rejection and persecution that we encounter for the reward of a better tomorrow for our families. 
and for our country. We have to be prepared. We have to remain faithful. We have to be, be equipped. We have to equip ourselves to preach the world, preach the word, excuse me, uh, you know, what, day in and day out, so to speak, to live it uh, as, uh, Paul, as uh, uh, Paul did, as Timothy did, as Lois did, as Eunice did, as Timothy did, as faithful followers of Christ. And, and um, just, just a quick look at Philippians 2.15 here. And uh, if you recall, Colson talked about joyous, joyously doing these things, and we see that right here in uh, verse 15 of, of Philippians chapter 2. It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. In other words, do it joyously so that you'll prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent in this crooked and perverse generation. Lights of the world holding forth the truth. Okay. So we do all these things. And so from uh, most people like to, 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 they look for prescriptive things. How do I do this? How do I live my faith out in a world that's so corrupt, as an example? That's a, that's a legitimate question. How do I do that? What do I do to, and, and, and then uh, to, to help contend for the faith beyond the walls of this church as, uh, and, and, uh, or beyond the walls of my home? How do I do that? And, uh, you know, I think that, that on, the, on the topic of a practicality here, uh, Philippians 2.15 is, is a great reminder and a motivator as we consider how to contend for the faith because, uh, because we do live in this uh, cr- crooked and perverse generation uh, that's intent on destroying everything that is godly or biblical. Um, how do we do that? And um, many of you are familiar with the saying, all politics are local. Well, the reality is, as one who spent 10 years as a lobbyist and as a political advocate for private property rights, uh, I can tell you that there's great truth in that statement. With few exceptions, most politicians start out at the local level. They hold a local office, they gain a little bit of experience, they move to the state, and, and some of them you know, end up moving into to, uh, federal office. It's not always the case, certainly. We know exceptions to that rule, but uh, more often than not. Um, and so uh, the one way to uh, get uh, to have a voice is to uh, become involved in the process and understand the process. Uh, you and I each have a vote. You know, it's only 20%, less than 20% of the people vote in elections. Less than 20% of the people are determining what happens. Now, I know some of you are sitting out here, this is a political speech, it's not a political speech, and I, I'm not going to finish it off that way, but, but you're asking for, okay, a practical reason. What, how, what can I do to contend? Okay? Well, you, w- one way you can contend is, is uh, uh, just to, to go show up at, at uh, school board meetings and county uh, commissioner meetings and city council meetings and see what goes on. See what goes on. I mean, you can watch most of them on TV. I mean, you don't even have to go. Okay, but um, know what's going on in the public arena around you, and uh, educate yourself on what the issues are, and start with the foundational documents for our country. How about that? You really know what it says. Now, I took civics and government, all that stuff, when I was in, coming up through the ranks of uh, school, and but uh, as I understand it, okay. Public schools don't even teach that anymore as part of their curriculum. It's not something you have to take. And so how do, how do you, how, uh, and I know that, that we have a lot of homeschoolers here, and so I know that, that that's a part of, of what you, the, the disciplines that you uh, instill in these kids. But w- what if they didn't get exposure to that anywhere? What would, you know, there's no wonder that only 20% of the people vote. Um, and so, um, that's a good place to start. Last year, uh, Gail and I, uh, along with the Parkers, uh, we 
went, uh, we participated in a workshop entitled Biblical Citizenship. And uh, it was made available through the Patriot Academy, so you may be familiar with it. And um, so it has 12 segments in it. And then, then our small group went through this uh, workshop together as well. And in it, it goes back to the founding documents and, and, and it explores the, the basis that these things were written on and the protections that we have. And I mean, 35% of the stuff that's in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution comes right out of Scripture. Um, anyway, it was a really enriching experience, and I, I digress, and I, I need to move on here. So I promise you I'll wrap up here in the next three, four minutes, maybe 10. No, I'm just joking. So, um, we, uh, so, so I mean, you, maybe that's a good place to start is to, you, you, is to uh, go through this course. I mean, you can, you can order the curriculum if you want to pay 65 bucks and sit there in your, your, uh, the, your den or family room, and you can go through it. Uh, or you can participate in one of the classes. So, uh, but it was a great, great exercise. And then you could get involved. Uh, let me just give you an example, of, uh, a practical example of how that kind of stuff works, okay? Uh, and then I'll give you some other options uh, other than just civic involvement. Um, but uh, last fall, well, actually it was about two years ago, uh, uh, um, a number of you may be familiar with Tide Turner's. And they were really, really distraught and unhappy. And a lot of the people in this, uh, in, in that are here today uh, went to uh, some meetings that the school board had with regard to critical race theory and about gender uh, uh, declaration. Uh, males and de more declares females can play on uh, women's sports, things, that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, there was this group that got together a couple of years ago, and they found candidates that they wanted to run. Uh, for office, and they, they were successful in getting four people on the board, uh, on the, on the uh, school board. And so the policies of the school board are now, you know, they're making policy changes that affect uh, and that uh, essentially a, a change in the perspective and the, uh, you know, uh, that integrate, as it were, uh, you know, what we would consider practical. I mean, common sense, hello, and much of this stuff, but it brings that Christian worldview into to, uh, uh, the arena, as it were. And uh, they've already had some successes in that great work. But it, it may be, maybe you're called to, you don't, you don't have time for that necessarily, or, or, but that's not your stick, but you, know, you could have a, uh, do a neighborhood Bible study and, and, and uh, reach out to some of the people that live around you, invite them in for a Bible study. Uh, that's, that's certainly a very practical way to do it. Or do there are mentoring programs that are available that you can get involved in, and you can mentor some child that has uh, has does not have a father in the home, uh, or doesn't have a mother in the home, whatever it may happen to be. So I mean, it, there's plenty of things to do that you can ways that you can affect the world and the changes that need to go on in it, for, so that the biblical worldview will become the predominant worldview. Uh, now, um, it's time for us to stand up and be counted, in my opinion. And uh, all you have to do is be willing. Be willing instruments and seek God and boldly at his direction, boldly and lovingly be the light of the world to this crooked and perverse generation. I can't help but, but think about, and this is the last thing I'll say, okay? This passage in Isaiah chapter 6, and we sang a song, and I talked about it last week a little bit, where uh, Isaiah sees a vision of God. And God sitting on his throne. And he's calling men to, to, him, to himself and also calling Isaiah as part of Isaiah being called to service to do the, exactly the same thing that we're talking about here today because uh, the, the Israelites, the Jews, were right in the middle of an era of debauchery and crookedness. You know, same thing we're talking about here. And they, and they were looking for people to come and he said, he, he, in those verses, one through six is all we looked at last week. But if you look at seven and eight, he calls 
And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. So maybe one of you will be the Isaiah. Let's pray. Father, I uh, am grateful, Lord, that uh, uh, for the privilege uh, and opportunity I had to, to share from my heart today the things that you have, uh, that you have been, that I've been troubled about, that you have uh, uh, allowed me to work uh, on and work through. And uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, the message uh, uh, would not fall on deaf ears that it would be uh, a message that uh, some would take uh, and that they would um, answer your call to uh, demonstrate and be an instrument for change, positive change, uh, in, in our, the families, in the communities, in our, throughout the church. Uh, and... And uh, we know, Lord, that that type, all it takes is just one. And we can see, we know what can happen from that. And uh, we can, we can uh, just uh, think of examples in our own minds if we, if we do that. But so we, uh, we pray, Lord, that you, uh, you would not uh, allow uh, the message to fall on deaf ears, but to uh, inspire someone, to inspire us all, really, uh, to uh, step out boldly and confidently and to be prepared for what is to come but be used as your instruments in this uh, perverse and crooked generation that we live in as lights to the world. And we do it with great joy, the joy of our salvation. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.